Welcome to our series on working with implicit experience in psychoanalysis. I'm Lynn Preston and I'm the initiator of this project of gathering together the wide spectrum of approaches to implicit experience. This marks the 20th anniversary of APSP, the Association for Psychoanalytic Self-Psychology, and it includes a two-part conference called Beyond Words. I'm delighted to have with me this evening philosopher Eugene Genlin. He is unique in the world of philosophy because he is also a renowned psychologist. And his psychology is informed by the philosophy. And uh, now we have a practice associated with philosophy which happened in ancient times but hasn't happened for a long time. Um, Jean's writings span the gamut from his popular book, Focusing, which has been translated into 14 languages, to his philosophical works, one of the recent ones, Language beyond postmodernism. Focusing is a practice associated with this philosophy that has applications all over the world and is used for many different kinds of things, not just for, um, not just for clinical practice, but for writing, for peacemaking, for thinking projects. Uh, they're using it in Afghanistan with uh, in little villages for uh, healing, for uh, community building. It's quite an amazing international community. I'm going to talk to Eugene Genlin tonight about his ideas in psychotherapy, about implicit experience, and we're going to see how they fit with the other ideas that, that we've been talking about um, in this series. Eugene Genlin's philosophy has a lot to offer psychoanalysis in a fresh meta-theory that not only helps us to understand implicit experience, but also brings into focus the very nature of change and emergence. And so um, we're going to start with the question of that he's going to talk about actually at the conference. That the title of his talk is "What is the implicit anyway, and how do we find it?" So we'll start with that question. One of the things that to notice is that words can mean many different things, and the etymology of a word also hints at some of what it can mean. Implicit means folded in as if everything were already there, just hidden from sight. Implicit, in my use of it, does not mean that at all. It means something that can be created further, that can be carried further, that can be opened up further, that can be formulated further. And in that sense, we always live actually in the implicit. So currently it's in style to say that none of the concepts work, uh, nothing that anybody has asserted is, is uh, necessarily reliable, and to a certain extent that's true. But many people think that leaves us nowhere with nothing underneath. And actually if, if that were true, if we could just invent anything, we would all be rich and healthy and happy. And uh, where we really live is in something that is implicit. It's in a network of intricacy, none of, none of which, well let me say, all of which can never be explicated. So that if somebody wants to know how you feel, you say, fine. That's what you're supposed to say. I remember once I had a client and I would say, how are you? And she would say, fine, Jean, I'm so depressed. <laughs> because you're supposed to say fine. 
And then, you know, if you say, well, what, how do you really feel? Then it gets complex. But you may say, well, I have this kind of situation. I just lost this. And so naturally I feel bad. But then if you go in <clears throat> further, and we all know that, then it becomes much more intricate. The point that I don't think is clear to everybody is we live in an implicit texture. We don't live in the categories. We don't live in the formulated entities. We don't live among the furniture. Well, also we do, but we don't basically live in something formulated. We live in the implicit. That's where we live. So uh, many people are talking about two different kinds of systems of encoding and, and learning and memory. The explicit system that's linear and uh, rational um, and languaged and the implicit system that is procedural, has to do with action, affect, has to do with nonlinear well, yeah. processes. And I think you are talking about something a little bit different when you talk about implicit in that we're living in it as if it's very it's much bigger very than much so very much so uh, this uh, old way of splitting the affective from the cognitive uh, is a mistake to begin with because what we mean by our concepts and our most careful mathematical uh, precision is in the context of the implicit. So, for example, when a scientific theory produces findings that don't fit, then somebody who really knows the theory has to go home and figure out what changes could be made, because a theory has to connect to all the other theories. And uh, there, it turns out, of course, all the precise concepts are embedded in an implicit context all of which we don't know yet, and all of which doesn't exist yet, because when we do something, then we make something further that wasn't there before. So science changes every year, and the concepts that are now established won't even be there anymore ten years from now, except in the, in the section called History of Science in some other part of the library. And yet, right now, they represent the, 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 what we have so far done and what we have so far gotten back from what we have done. So when you split the implicit context in which we move and act from the map that we use to understand things, then you, you're lost to begin with. Mm. I'm understanding you saying two things there. One, that uh, it's a mistake to think about Im and implicit and explicit systems as really separate things. Yes. That um, there's implicit in the explicit and explicit in the implicit and that it's one system there. Um, yes. And but. the other thing that I'm yeah. understanding, let's see if I've I have I've got a but right. coming, but oh, go ahead. But, okay. Mm. <laughs> well, hold on to the but. I will, the, I will. The other thing that I'm understanding is that by implicit, we don't mean unfolding something that already is there, like in yes. the unconscious. There are yes. these things that we yes. that we sort of dig out. But yet, uh, the implicit is uh, infinitely, infinitely creative. At the same time, that there is inchoate something there. It's yes, there indeed. Nothing. Yes, it's created further. It's created further. It's yes. not just created because it's always already there. Yes. Even the newborn is incredibly complicated already, right there looking at you. Yes. So it's never like starting from blank. Yes. But yes. when we dig out what is there, this is why we do it. Because to formulate it and to become conscious of it and to say it as an it is a big change in it. And all the conceptions and cognitive work that we do is a carrying forward of this implicit. And to say it's not already there doesn't mean nothing is there. It means something is there such that you can carry it further in this way. Mm. 
So something is there, but it isn't an entity. The, or, right. Uh, the implicit is much more than what you can say. And it's more orderly, too, than what you can say. It's an organismic texture, and we make little boxes, and they're vital, these little boxes. They're, they, they allow us to do things, and they allow us to cure things. They allow us to build things. Uh, we couldn't live anymore on this planet, six billion of us, if we didn't have all this technological development. So that's all very important and very, you know, I call it sacred because so many of my friends want to say, oh, well, that's all. They don't like it. They would rather... It's mechanistic. Yeah, right. Um, no, no, no. But the reality or whatever you call it, the place, the, the, the what we study, the where we live is the implicit, not this geometric map that we change as, as we go along. The but I wanted to introduce yeah. is that at any given moment, they do seem like two different systems. Yes, yes. Because, but not between affective and cognitive at all. Rather, between what we already have formulated and what comes freshly. So even in a highly theoretical, technical, cognitive problem, you get to the edge of what you can think, and right there, you won't get any further just rearranging the old concepts. You have to go to this implicit sense that you have that there's more. And when you think freshly, you know a lot of things that you could say off the top of your head that are all true and right, and you leave those all aside, and you stay in this spot where you're stuck. Mm -hmm. And a person could say that's uh, self-punitive in, in a sense. But you keep going to the place where you're stuck because you sense that something further, new, newly formulated, newly carried further, will come there, and that's better than covering it over. You know, somebody says immediately, you must now say something sensible. Well, you can do that, but you wouldn't want to lose the edge. And this is where we have our, our thinking practice, our thinking at the edge practice, because it turns out that even people who are not at all theoretical and not at all interested in new concepts, love to think. Yes, they certainly do. And in do. our schools, they teach us that thinking is memorizing concepts and then rearranging them and giving them back, and that's very boring. So people tend to lose the capacity to think freshly. And it, in that sense, doesn't matter what you want to think about. Thinking freshly is very exciting, and you can find it again by going to this implicit place, which does indeed feel like a different system. It feels like it's in your body, whereas what you already know is more up here somewhere, people make that distinction. In that sense, it's two different systems, and they're very different in that sense. Mm -hmm. Things come from underneath very shyly, and little bitty steps at it one time, and even though it feels slow because you have to wait a few seconds all the time, it's really very rapid, but it feels slow, whereas upstairs feels very fast. What you already know comes very quickly. I just want to say for, for people watching this video that Thinking at the Edge is a, a system of helping people to do creative thinking. Yeah, it's and little instructions, it's, little yeah, steps. Yeah, little steps. Focusing, so, too. We have these little instructions. Once you learn where this is, you can throw the instructions away, of course. You don't have, you do, we, we don't think by steps or focus by steps, but to find it in the first place, it's good to have these little... Go ahead. Thinking, thinking at the edge and focusing is about finding this edge, yes, this yes, unclear yes. edge, this edge of awareness, and uh, going a step yes, further yes. from, from that place. And uh, you know, I want to say that, that people that have done this thinking at the edge are so excited about the creativity that just comes from underneath yes. when you yes. go to that edge. Yes. This reminds me of my next question about how you became interested in the implicit and um, what I remember you um, saying was that you were very excited about philosophy 
but you didn't want to just learn what philosophers had come up with, but to go to that yes. edge yeah. where that yes. larger realm yes. where they dipped into that. Yes. Where, where yes. did they get these things? So yes, they dipped of into this larger yes. realm, and how yeah. did they do that? I will say, and and be open to people disagreeing with me if they like, I will say that philosophy is thinking at an edge. Mm -hmm. Philosophy is changing the kind of concepts that you use. Philosophy is not the conclusions of a philosophy. Philosophy, each philosophy is a way of dipping into this implicit complexity and refashioning the way concepts work. Almost all the, with some exceptions, almost all the concepts that we are taught, that we use in this culture, are the kind that assume that what you're talking about is over there somewhere, and you're over here, and you're perceiving it, or you're looking at it, or you're interpreting it, or you're formulating it, but their I, it, kind of split and they're about that out there. The reality is out there. Is out there. Here right, I am right. At and it. that's a certain kind of concept I call it. And again, I want to say I'm not putting it down, it's very valuable. Without it we wouldn't have our technology and so forth and so on. But it's not the only kind of concept you can have. So I'm I've been for many years uh, creating a kind of concept that carries the implicit along with what it conceptualizes. Which in, in simple terms would mean that when you get something formulated to your satisfaction, keep where you were coming from with you. So that you have the implicit and the explicit can when you think. Can you give an example of that, uh, that idea of keeping the implicit with you. Uh, let's just take an example of... Well, to me, anything I ever say is an example because... So when I say concept, I'm already doing that. Mm -hmm. I think concepts would be some kind of empty diagrams that you can produce uh, on command. But a concept is a formulation of some kind from a formulation with, a formulation in, a formulation... Uh, well, it'd be something like showing somebody a picture of somebody you love. Uh, they only see the picture, but you have the picture and your sense of that person. And there's no way you're going to have the picture without your sense of that person. But you can think in that fashion. And I'm doing it right now because I'm describing that very linkage there. And I'm describing it very simply. When it gets complicated, I would say I need, to, I need to explain a few characteristics of such a concept. Such a concept is never just the cognitive part. It's always also the movement that it represents to the concept and the further that it implies now implies, okay, Im implicit and implies. Yeah. You say something to somebody, you make a point, you say something exciting, okay. If they understand it, if you can see on their face and body that, oh yeah, they see what's exciting, they have grasped not only what you said, but that whole thing. <clears throat> now my phrase, that whole thing, refers to the implicit. That whole thing, that whole concept, that situation, uh, why you're excited about it, the import of it, what it means to you. And they won't know all of that to be able to say, but they can sense it. They sense why you're, why you're excited about it. And you can sense that they sensed it. And so you feel like, oh, that was good to tell you. Mm. You could use the very same words with another person and they would say, oh, that's nice or something. And you could see that they only received a very small verbal part, okay? Yeah, so in common language when we say, oh, he really gets it, 
Yeah. We, we need this larger thing, this more that the yes. person gets. Yes. That's carried. It has a further. It has an edge that that goes out, and then if you were to say, you know, can you put that into words? Probably not very very easily, and you can't put all of that ever into words. But now let me make a jump to philosophy. Having said that, mm -hmm. wh where I'm coming out is the structure of a concept, whether you're talking about a rock or an electron or a piece of furniture or whether you're talking about a person or a feeling or a society. You see, philosophy is very peculiar because it isn't about anything. It's about how to think about anything. So I could I rattle off this list anything. and you don't need to look at the list because I won't mean anything, whatever. The concepts that we have are just is concepts. And what we need are concepts that have an is, whatever is, but also have the implying of more, of further, mm. which we can call process, or I call it process, but that can mean other things to people. There is always an implying further in life. Anything living has its own further implying, its own further pushing, its own further needing, its own further creating, its own further edge, its own further... And you see what happens. Mm. You can use all these different words, mm. none of which are quite right, and all of which can say this once you have the implicit meaning of right. it. Right. This more. Right. Right. So a concept that is also a forward also a further, is a different kind of concept than the ones where you have the is and then you want to change it. So you call it change and then you have a different is. These are all concepts that... So, so how to understand the human being, and not only a human being, anything, has always this further implicit living activity of the next thing that would come if it came. So everything in that way has the implying yes. with it. Yes. It has a something yes. that it's going toward. Yes. Uh, yes. So if you have, for example, you have a client and you have figured something out about the client. But you also know that how it is in... It doesn't have to be a client, but we're talking therapy. Yes, we're right? It could be anybody. The other person. Ask that thing that you're saying, oh, there he goes again being like that, you know. And that's not false, but you have to know that in that person it has, first of all, a whole implicit texture which you can never completely know. And then that texture has possibilities of furtherness which you can't know. And in doing therapy, we depend on that. If, it, if therapy... We depend on the not knowing. No, on that really, which we don't know. Because on we, that de which we, don't we know. depend upon that there's more there than we've so far had. Otherwise, yes. we would give up because... <clears throat> It's sort of like a budget. If you list all the income and all your expenses, you never come out well uh, because there are other possible ways of doing everything from one day to the next. If we really only had what has already been understood, very often it would be, it would be hopeless. We depend upon the fact that there's more there and that what is there has more further possibilities than what we so far know. And so if we respond to that, if we either say that back or respond humanly to it or something in such a way that the person can be in touch with the implicit movement that's there, that's when it, there's hope. Right. So and the, if, the person isn't simply a something, whatever Exactly, something exactly. Be, Thank you. A something like a borderline or a whatever. Anything, any kind of is. Any kind of is. Right. 
an artist or anything. That's right. The person That's right. The is person also a, a movement. Right. And the movement yeah. hasn't happened yes. yet. So it, that yes. sense of the movement. The next has movement been. always hasn't happened yet. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Which brings us to uh, a good time to give a clinical example of the implicit and of this kind of forward movement yeah. that's in everything. I have an example, but I don't know how accurately I, I can recall it. It's, it's a week old. And there were, the, the trouble with giving, I, I will give it, but I need to say there were more little tiny steps in between than I can remember. And it's very characteristic of this, what I would like to show, that there are these intricate little steps and, and a tape is very much better than memory. But I have this client who, whose purpose in coming basically is that she hasn't been able for years and years and years to do her music. As a, as a girl, she was wonderfully creative and recognized and everything else. And then uh, something happened. They got her to learn the regular stuff. And ever since they got her to learn the regular stuff, she hasn't, she hasn't done it. She hasn't been able to do it. And now as an adult, a middle-aged person, she's super unable to do it. And that's do her complaint. Her music. She yeah, and she will berate herself about this. And I always get, as a therapist, discouraged by this external, you know, I went home and I had all this time and wouldn't you think I would try to do and I didn't and I'll do anything else and yeah, yeah. Uh, this kind of stuff yes. I see you you recognize yes, yes. and somehow my job is to hear from the inside some way this berating from the outside won't get us very far and the the other thing I typically don't don't like so much is but 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 I do I go with is reports of events so she comes in and she she knows all that. She comes in and she sits a while quietly and then she says, well, I better get work out of the way. Meaning, implicitly, I know you're not so excited about that and I also know that I'm going to spend half the hour just telling about, but somehow I can't get it out of the way unless I do this. Yes, I have to tell you this. And there again, one way of talking about the implicit is it's always there. It's like there's so few words between two people who know each other well, like a therapist and a patient, that they, they know that they know that they know that they know without, yeah. without knowing being explicit, without not only not said, but not even thought separately. It's like you just understand, oh yeah, right. So she it was has like all that. This knowing yeah. of you and what you. And herself, and herself. in a sense. And, and all the criticism about how I waste the time and all that stuff she didn't say and I didn't think. We just knew. Okay, so then she tells me this longish story, the upshot of which is that she's very disappointed in this young guy who's worked for her for a year. She's in a sort of middle range position in the company. Uh, because she's been pushing him and she's been championing him and defending him and trying to get him a better salary and a better position. And just because he didn't, it, it, something happened, he was very unpleasant with her and she saw a side of him that she didn't know he had. And the, and I don't remember what I said, but I said something like, it hurt or you were disappointed or something or other. And then typically for me I would have said you felt it didn't you or you felt it here or where did you feel it or can you feel it in your body. Or, but I don't remember saying that but somehow and I don't know how she's got her hands over her heart and she's saying it's here. So then it was important to me to see if I couldn't keep her here instead of going back up there and attacking herself. And I said something, I don't know what, and she said, well, I can be the same with him from now on, but it won't be quite the same. And then I 
knew to say, oh, here it will be different, you know. Mm. Something here will be closed that was open before. Mm. And that was right. And she said a little about, I'm very often open here. Just when I sit down with my instrument, I'm not. Mm. Which again, implicitly, we're always working on that, of course. So, so then I felt that we were hearing from the inside place. I said, oh, it's just like with this guy, it, with the instrument, it, it can't open, something like that. And I'm, I, I think I also said, I'm glad we're hearing from it, saying that, I, I can't open under those conditions, under those circumstances. What, what, what would it take to be able to open? And she said something about, well, feeling some kind of loving all around. Then, and, and I'm not sure how she said that, but the phrase that sticks in my mind is, then I could open in response. Mm. And so, to me, that's a good example here of what arises from underneath is, has this different quality to it. So, then my way is when, when, when we're there, then I want to keep us there. So then I would slowly say back, oh, if you can, if you can be in response, it can open. And I don't know how I said it back, mm. but I'm sure I said it back three times. And from there, more comes always in these little steps. So then the next thing I heard was there's so much fear there with the instrument. Oh, I said, yeah, right, there's fear there. And it's not that we didn't know for several months mm. upstairs that she scared some way. We said that. But it's very different to say, you know, what am I afraid of? Am I afraid of ridicule? Am I afraid of not performing properly? Am I, I must be afraid of something. Is very familiar. It's very different to say, oh, there's so much fear there. She was sensing it right then. Yes, it, the it, yes. And then after a while she said, and so much sadness. And then after a while she said, Oh, I think I'm afraid of the sadness. Mm. Which I took to mean of it being too much to stand sort of washing in or something. But, but whether, whether that's right yeah. or not. Uh, these are very much examples. And again, upstairs as, as uh, psychologists, we find it easy to say, oh, uh, the fear might be of the sadness, or the sadness might be because of what you missed because of the fear, or the fear might be uh, of judgment and the sadness. Is, uh, but I can always think of 12 or 14 things up there in terms of categories. Whereas from down here, it's like, oh, and it had in it, I think, oh, I think the fears of the sadness. Mm. So then I w would, in such a situation, emphasize that we, oh, we're hearing from it. And because I can't say we're glad we're hearing from it because I'm not sure she, she is, is. Yeah. I say I'm glad we're hearing from it, which I am. And I'm glad it's speaking to us and it's saying with that much fear and sadness I, I, I can't open but if I had the, something like loving around me then I could and I say it in that kind of tone very quietly like you mm. don't want to disturb mm. something and I don't know if that, if that I indicates but at least to sum up I want to say in any given moment, for any given individual, the implicit is a different place than what you say mm. from up here. It's a genuinely different system in that sense. Mm -hmm. 
and hearing from it, even if the content is the same as what you said upstairs, it's very different and it has different possibilities. And among the possibilities is always the life forward possibility. There's always the, and again, any words I use are just words, so you have to feel with me what I'm trying to say here with my hands, sort of. Uh, it always wants to live. And no matter how angry it is and how self-destructive it talks and how everything else, there's always the life forwardness. Just like if you hold your breath, it always wants to inhale and exhale. And so there is always going to be something that will take us further in the life direction. And the other things that come, well, we have to acknowledge them. We have to say, oh, yes, that's right. Here's all that sadness, and here's the fear. And yeah, but, but we're hearing from it saying, if I had something around me, I could open. She that's was. all she said, but implicit in it is, I would want to, or it would want to. Mm or it says it would like to. Mm -hmm. Okay. She, she is opening in the moment. Oh, yes. As she oh, yeah. Is. This is your point. Now, go ahead and make it more. I, I know you. Well, the, my, <laughs> my point that, that in your tone, in your surround, Yes. There is that love, yes. and she is opening, yes. she, because she and she is responding, yes. Yes. and the two of you together yes. are responding. That's right. To, to me, yeah. re relationality, to me, is in the implicit. So implicit in here is our relationship. Implicit in here is that to certainly, to some extent, I think a very real extent, she is being surrounded by a lover. Yes. And that probably helped that come and say, if I were, I would. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. that's already a meta-analysis to me. What's important is to live the relationship, not so much to talk about it. We can talk about it if she wants to, but you see what I mean? That's where we maybe differ. I'm very aware of the quality of the relating. It needs to feel like this, smooth and together. And the minute something disturbs it, I say, wait, what was that? Or I said something wrong, didn't I? Or something. So if it, if it bumps, I don't ignore that for sure. Then I, I need to bring it up. But if we're going smoothly together, I don't, uh, that's sufficiently relational to me even if the person never says a word about us or me or we. Right, for you. <coughs> yeah. It's not so important to, to make explicit the us, but for you, the uh, implicit is always including... It's always, and it's always surround. relational. It's always it's relational. It's always relational. If you're sitting alone in your room, you're, you're away from people to start with. You know, and that's relational, and you may be glad you're, you're away from them, or you may be lonely, or, or any number, but there's always, always a relational relation. quality. And when you respond to yourself, that's also an interaction of, of a sort. Especially this, this implicit system is very much like another person. It, like you say this, and it says, uh-uh. And you say, well, tell me what it is. And it says, I can't. It says, oh, all right, we'll wait, you know. It's almost like a conversation between two people. Focusing is a conversation between these two systems that I denied were two separate systems because they are the same organism. I love the way you put it sometimes about there. there is nothing uh, there, and yet... No, no entity there, like in the unconscious, and yet it talks back. Well, I, I denied that there's nothing there. Well, you denied that there is no thing there. There's, there's no thing there. But their things are there too, but they're not the ultimate. The, the things are only, they're only separately fashioned things that we all know. Well, now I have to say, 
There are lots and lots and lots of entities and things and geometric and formulated mathematical and all kinds of technological separate entities that are always there in the implicit. Both ways. They don't exist without the implicit. Mm. And the implicit doesn't exist without your all human experience things. of all yes. those things. Yes, yes, yeah. Which you, it seems to me, say about theory is always there. Theory is always there in uh, in everything that you are yeah, feeling. Yeah, any thinking. theory that you that you know it's that made any there. sense to you is functioning for you. If you stick with one theory and you try to derive the person in front of you from your theory, that's deadly. But all the theories that you ever knew are helping you sense this completely different person. Yes, yes, yes. Who isn't exactly. going to fit any of them, but you wouldn't understand them as well if you didn't have all these theories. Right. Maybe maybe a better way to say it is that that there's that we aren't made up of formed things yes, that's right. that are there. That's right. And yet the and and also or more importantly or astonishingly, this what hasn't yet lived yet talks back. Yet, right. It, 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 with your with your patient she is sensing what's there and it's responding, right. it's opening as you and she together right. are That's sensing right. it. Right, and in my example it doesn't happen, but very often it happens that I will say something and just the way what I'm saying is wrong will bring the response that's really there. Mm -hmm. Yes, that you are, you're, you're as the therapist, sensing into her implicit place, which yes. also includes Yes, you. and I'm responding to it, and I'm speaking to it, and I'm saying, oh, well, it sounds like it goes this way, and then it opens, and it's exactly not the way I said, but we're both glad I said that because it talks back. Yes. And you're making a relationship with it, not... You're making yes, a relationship that's with her, true. which includes all the That's very true. Whatever, I feel very but much you are like that. You're making a relationship with yes. it. Yes. And I often say that, like especially if I do something wrong or there's an interruption or or something goes badly and then we 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 we, we do something with it, we fix it or something, or I'm late or something like that. Uh the tradition teaches us that the person is angry even if they say they're not angry or they're hurt or they're something. But I found this way of, because the person will always say, oh, that's fine now, it's all right, I understand what happened. And I say, yeah, I know it's fine with you, but would you please apologize for me downstairs? <laughs> and they understand that. Uh -huh. And they do that, actually, right. do go down and... Right, right, Let it right. feel that somebody is apologizing. Right, right, yes. I, I think it's so important that that implicit is also a self. It's also a somebody. It's Very not much just so. A something. Very it's much a somebody so. Yes. that needs yes. to be yes. Yes. related to. Yes, yes. I could throw in here that I feel that I understand now that these partials selves so-called or sub-selves or what, whatever, this child inside and other, other people in there that you are, that's normal. What makes, uh, what makes it really a, a trouble is when the different parts are not allowed to know about each other. Mm -hmm. That's what makes the multiple phenomenon. Right. Not the fact that there are many. Only the fact that for some people something is too awful to stand and so it gets split up and this one carries this and that one carries and the, all that kind of thing. And yeah. as, soon as, they, as soon as they're all here, whichever one is speaking, they're all here, then you're okay. I wanted to go back to the, the point about what's in this implicit and bring up one of the papers that I 
enjoy so much the the Finlochite paper. Oh, okay, but you you were going to mention some very different points of view, and I would like to react. But do that first. Which what you wanted first, okay. and then you can think who you want. The, in in the the Finlochite paper, I I love the description of the the different way that the implicit is organized or it's a different language or uh, however we would say it that um, it's a nonlinear kind of experiencing in which uh, things aren't sequenced the way they are in, in our what you call upstairs um, and the the you and me aren't a s separate kinds of uh, uh, entities there, okay. but but there's this whole um, texture of. So I'm not sure that I'm going to say what you want me to, but it brings me to two okay, things that good. might be what you mean. One of them is that I, and this is again a philosophical point. Uh, I think interaction is always first, and then the separate entities that are supposedly meet each other and interact, they come second for me. And that's also a change because we don't have concepts for that. We have to make them freshly. Because even the word interaction presumes that there's a person and another person and they meet, or there are two things and they meet. And I'm saying, no, a living thing is always already both the living body and the environment before you can talk about them separately. And yeah, you can say that certain things are true of the body that are not true of the rest of the environment and vice versa, but that's not how it comes. It always comes first as interaction already. Mm. And the people who want to say that everything is dialogue and everything is interactions, there's a difference between philosophy and, and psychology. Without philosophy and without some different kind of concept, what most people are saying these days about it's all interaction, it's all interpersonal, it's all dialogue, they are precisely assuming what they want to deny. They're assuming that there are two people and they meet in a room you know, and they're separate people and they meet and then you deny that they, this one has anything in them apart from the meeting and you deny that that one has anything in them apart from the meeting and that's all desperately wrong. We're yeah. all interactional to begin with in the very nature of how we, of how we live. And sure, I'm not inherently interactional with this person and when I'm there relating to that person, I'm only partially relating to that person. I'm always carrying certain situations around with me in which I'm related much more importantly than I am to, you know, some person. Or if that is my most important or a very important person, then I am deeply related, but I'm deeply related because I am relational before I ever came out of the womb. We are part of this whole living system that, uh, well, that we then yeah, are. But, but we create it further. And yeah. We live it, or you can say it lives us further, or you can say we live it further. That would be the same thing for me. Uh, but it isn't just one whole and then we're part of the whole and everything is applesauce and goodbye. Uh, that kind of wholeness just annoys me because it's too too comfortable or too simple or something or other. It's much more important to me to to feel related to you, knowing that I'm a relational thing, and I'm not only relational with other people. I'm also relational to myself. I can also respond to my own already relational, interactional, implicit texture and 
to ignore that and think that all that's ever important is what we can explicitly say to each other is a very poor denial of the human being, I think. I think for psychoanalysts that that distinction is made in terms of uh, the idea that, that interpersonal relations are not outward uh, people relating and responding to each other. Yes, sure. But intersubjectivists talk about um, what they call the myth of the isolated mind, that there is no mind that's isolated, that's uh, a thing in and, in and of itself, because we, of course, don't exist in that way. Yet. It's not a matter of the mind being. It doesn't start with the isolated mind. It the starts with the isolated body, cell. The, uh-huh. Right? Yes. There is yes. no isolated amoeba. There is no isolated and anything. There is no isolated anything. That's right. Now right. you're doing philosophy. So <laughs> you start with the isolated mind, I think it's not so great because I don't think there is a mind in that sense. It's an organism. Yes, there is no isolated right. organism. Right. Okay. Yes. The other thing that you might have meant is that when when you examine the implicit texture the way I have, you find that it doesn't consist of separate factors. This is going to sound like the same, but it's a different point. It doesn't consist of separate factors that get together and affect each other. Each thing that you formulate as a factor is already affected by the other things that you think it affects. And this might be difficult to explain. It's easy to just say. Uh, Anything in the implicit texture, anything that you separate functions not as itself, but as it can function in affecting other things that affect it. That have already affected it. Yes, exactly. Thank you. And that it has already affected it before you've picked it out That's right. as one thing. That's right. Thank so you. It's, yeah. It is a hard thing to express or for, for us to say, but let's, let's go back to your patient there whose problem well, of opening... Let me just say, I think heart. human relationships are an example of that. You want to say it's 50% your fault and 50% my fault, but that's not true. It's 100% your fault and 100% my fault because Mm -hmm. the way I am has already determined some of how you are, which has already affected me. That's the point you want. Yes, yes, yes. Good. And and, and also, uh, if we take any factor like your patient's heart not opening to her instrument, that uh, that has been affected and has affected so much of everything else. So what we're trying to get at here is this idea that you call inter-affecting and how it applies to that example that you gave of this woman with her closed heart. So one, one, one example to bring that home is we all know that if we're at a moment of having to do something and not yet decided what we're going to do, that, for example, if there's, if there's somebody after you or you're about to fight somebody, you, you have to decide, are you going to turn and fight or are you going to look for something some instrument to use like a weapon or you're going to hide under the table or you're going to leave the place. You, These are all possibilities that are together in the sense that if you do any one of those things you can't do the other thing. So any one that you do changes the others and all of them are implicit in each possibility they have already affected what they are 
before they come. And you don't have time, usually, if you do, that's even very nice. You don't have time to th pursue each one to see which one you might like. The organism totals it up and you do something. When you look back, the organism has taken account of either all of them or most of them, perhaps not every one of them, but it's like when there's a bundle of alternatives, they're not like a bundle of sticks next to each other, they're into each other. Each alternative is already not doing the others or doing them differently. It's or, instantaneous, it isn't in a progression. It doesn't take, yes, that's right. And I'm saying that everything is like that. So each very finely organized something that you find is already an inter-affecting of a whole lot of factors. So you can find them in each thing. So when she when she can open the open, I don't want to use now because we're using it for open the heart, uh, when she can enter her, her sense of this guy that works for her and her disappointment and then eventually the, 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 the way that is in her body, the way any of us react, and this is well known, the way we react to anything involves a whole lot of us. It involves a whole lot of our past and our childhood and our other situations. It wouldn't be right to say it involves everything but it involves a whole lot of things. And all those things that it involves are crossed with each other in such a way that this one reaction emerges, just as you do one thing out of these possibilities that are all into each other. So what I don't want to say is that everything she told me is all one great big goulash stew. That's not what I mean, just the opposite. Each thing she says is a one thing that implicitly arises from an intricacy of a whole lot of other things. So it's a whole that has all of this exquisite in it, intricacy And in it. has an implying of a very particular demanding thing so that if you don't get that implying right, you're just not saying it, you're not speaking from it, you're not carrying it further. That's the, the idea of the, of the specificity of yes. Uh, yes. what's required yes. in carrying something. Yes, so through. I'm not at all saying that everything is all one great big hole and, 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 and then you can't get any further. No, I'm not saying everything is a whole. I'm saying each thing is a whole. Each, each moment doesn't ever come back again. Each moment is this and this wanting, this single thing that it wanted, constituted out of all of these many, many implicit... And you see, we don't have, we don't have concepts to say that. We have to make them freshly, and that's what I'm doing. Good. So I call it inter-affecting. And even the language is against me there because inter still implies two things that then inter effect. But by inter effecting, I mean just the opposite. I mean, it's already all of these things. They they never were separate things. And yet it also has the next step that it wants. Mm. And then if you find the right action or the and that's what right means here. If you find the right action or the right statement. Often, the, most of our actions are statements. If you find the right statement, then you carry that demanding intricacy forward. And again, carrying forward is a phrase that I'm using because the language doesn't give us anything for that. In the language as usual, we either create something from nothing, now it's here, and before it wasn't, or we find it, we dig it out and it was already there. And yet that neither of those will ever explain most things, particularly psychotherapy. 
Yes. Be, because just digging out the old stuff wouldn't change anything. And just making it up, just telling stories of how you wish it were, doesn't do anything either. And so you need carrying forward, which says that when you touch there, when you enter there, when you attend there, when you listen there, and once you know what I mean, it doesn't matter which word I use, once you're there, then the possibility of carrying it forward exists, which is to say its own implying wants a further statement, a further action or something. And when you do that one, then you can really feel that that's the one that relieves the tension. That's the one that lets you live. That's the one you found it. And at that point, what you say has its own, its own corroboration, its own certainty. We call that a felt shift because you can, you can feel it. It feels something like when you forgot what you were supposed to do today and then you remember. It's like, in, you know, many experts could come and tell you that you don't remember, but you know you remember. They could tell you, no, you should have gone to the dentist. You say, yes, I know I should have gone to them, but this is what I forgot and now I have remembered. It feels exactly like that, except that you have never thought that before explicitly. It was only there. But this carrying forward doesn't say you find it already, nor does it say you make it out of nothing. So I'm arguing with the people who, who I mean, it, there's a certain progress in, 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 in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis that 30 years ago, each writer and each therapist thought they knew about the patient. Their, their hypothesis would be right, you know. Freud said he was when he, when he saw he was wrong, he would take back his interpretation. But when you read his description of this, it took him nine months to say his, take his interpretation <laughs> back. <laughs> Five but times a week. Now that's over with, and so people are celebrating the fact that we no longer think we know. Now we're willing to say that we don't know how it goes in the other person. We only have a hypothesis or maybe three hypotheses. But now some people are saying there isn't anything there. You just tell a story together, you know, like that game where I take one sentence, the beginning, and you finish it, and make another half sentence, and I finish it. Now, surely that isn't what people want to mean by co-create. They, we I want them to want to mean that at each point, the person can physically check whether what they're saying is carrying that forward. And it's characteristic of focusing that you get that kind of tape recording where somebody says something and then they say, wait, wait, that's not quite right, uh, uh, uh. And then there's a silence. And then maybe they say, well, I don't know what it is, but one thing about it is, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you get these little steps. That's they're not found because they're fresh and new, but they're not made up, made either. There's this wonderful uh, inseparability between finding and making. Yes, yes. The finding the, and making. What's already there is much more intricately organized. It's much more finely demanding than anything that we say or diagram. And then it also wants another step. It wants a one thing out of all of that. I, I love the statement uh, that you made about every bit of human experience has within it in, implicitly a further step of movement. Yes. And that's very, very helpful for c clinicians because whatever yeah. it is, yeah. even the most awful, awful yes. thing yes. has implicit in it something that something would... Something that wants to go forward. And then, of course, we all know from, from doing therapy that these moments are... When a person finds it, it makes so much sense, and yet it's instantly changed. It's like, oh, I've been 
or to get simplistic about it, I've been trying to please my mother. You know, it's like the moment the person feels that completely, it's no longer going to be true. Not exactly that way, anyway. No. Now, you know, that doesn't mean the behavior changes. That could take years. But the sense of it is immediately, that's not, but, but it makes sense that I was trying to please my mother. Be, if I see why that happened, how that happened. Oh, of course, you know, the person I'm thinking of would say, I, it was a big job for me as a child. I was keeping her alive. Mm. You know, I was keeping her alive. It was up to me to keep her alive. Of course I would do that. So this moment of finding, or and I can think of one client who looks found in his examination of his homosexual stuff, it's not satisfying. Afterwards, I feel empty, but I feel driven to this all the time. And then when it opens up, it was, oh, I was tr I, I'm trying to get my penis back that I lost. Hmm. It makes so much sense. And yet the moment he finds it, that particular thing has changed. Hmm. That's what carrying forward is. It's like it's not just digging out an old fact. It's always already that you appreciate the sense that it makes. This one down here was trying to do something for life, was trying to do something that was meant to be forward, and yet it was this terribly destructive thing. Okay, okay, but it had its own forward impetus in it. And when you find that, then somehow there's a larger forward impetus, there's a larger life sense that you can no longer feel the same way. The, the sense of it as you formulate something yes. that has been unformulated, yes. as you formulate it, it is different. It's no yeah. longer the same thing. Exactly, exactly. And it's not just plain different. It's different in the way that it needed to be different. That what it was was a need for it to be different. Yes, that it has the forward movement in, in it. it. Yes. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. yes.